Hello, bonjour everyone, I hope you're doing great. Full disclosure, I am both excited and scared to review this episode. But anyway, let's learn with Philomena Kunk about the story of Britain during World War I and World War II. Nowadays, first world is something you put in front of the word problem to show that it isn't really that bad like running out of couscous or not being able to check Twitter in a tunnel. But back then, First World was what they called the war. The First World War had loads of nicknames. The War to End All Wars, the Great War, and of course, World War I. Why did they call World War I, World War I? It's quite a pessimistic numbering, isn't it? Or did they just know it was the start of a franchise? Uh, if it's a franchise, let's hope that they are not planning to make it a trilogy. And I think that the fact that the, the first one was such a big success was the five star cast with huge stars. Germany, UK, France, Russia. Plus twists such as Russia leaving after season three like Ned Stark in Game of Thrones and twists such as the US arriving at the end. Also, a great choice by the production was to change the teams to make France and UK together, for example, and that was honestly a genius idea. At the time, they weren't numbering the wars, although I think that in the First World War, the idea of it being a great war denoting the sheer scale of the conflict, the, um, the casualty rate was already becoming um, used quite a lot. So it was called the Great War, but not because it was great. The First World War was started by the killing of one man, Franz Ferdinand. You've probably never heard of him, or the band named after him. Oh, I love this band. And actually, the name of the band, they thought about it while watching a horse race in which one of the horses was named after Archduke Franz Ferdinand, which is quite an odd choice of name for a horse, if you ask me, but... But he was dead important, by which I mean he was only important when he was dead. His assassination triggered a series of other killings. Soon it caught on and everyone wanted to be killed. It was a bigger craze than fidget spinners. Eventually, Britain got sucked into the fighting and men queued up to have their flat caps converted into fighting men's helmets. Soon, hundreds of thousands of Tommies were heading for battle. Why were all the British soldiers in World War I called Tommy? Was that just a coincidence? No, it wasn't a coincidence. It's just a, a general name that became applied to British soldiers in the same way we talk of Fritz as being a generic name for German soldiers. But I have one example, uh, Tommy Shelby, uh, who was in World War I in the Somme and is actually a Tommy, so it's confusing. Actually, Tommy refers to Thomas Atkins, who was a fictitious name given at the end of the 18th century to an average English soldier and it became Tommy Atkins and finally Tommy. And I don't know who Thomas Atkins was. On the other side, Fritz was the diminutive for the first name Friedrich or Frederick. And it's probably due to the fact that there was actually quite a lot of Friedrich in the German Reich. And you also had the Samis, which were the nickname that the American soldiers had in France in reference to Uncle Sam. What happened in Norman's land? Norman. Were only people that were called Norman allowed in there? Well, it's not Norman's land. Uh, this is no man's land. Uh, and the idea being that this is particularly dangerous territory between uh, the lines of the Germans on one side and the British on the other. This is essentially just a, a killing zone, a very dangerous zone in between trench systems. Why did they fire shells at each other? Because shells wouldn't really hurt, would they? Unless there were those razor clam shells, because they're quite sharp, aren't they? I'd never thought of this kind of idea, but it's not that stupid because if you throw oysters at the other side, 
there's a possibility that they're going to be injured, that they will hurt their fingers, you know, with the little knives you use while trying to open them. That might have been a cunning plan. Well, these weren't seashells. These were heavy pieces of ordnance. We're actually talking about bits of metal in brass casing. So that's where the name shells comes from. All right. Looking at footage from the time, it's hard to get a grip on just how brutal it must have been for Tommy and Norman because it's in black and white and everyone's moving too fast, probably to avoid the shells. Even though it looks a bit like Charlie Chaplin, it's actually not funny at all. So you can't laugh, just like with Charlie Chaplin. One man who vividly captured the sheer horror of War One was the poet Wilfred Owen. If in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin, if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. You get the gist. My friend. Okay, here is the... My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some disparate glory, the old light. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori means it is sweet and honorable to die for your country. The old lie. And the poet died on November 4th, 1918 at around 11 a.m. And his mother learned of his death as the parish bells celebrated the armistice. As if the killing wasn't bad enough, the accommodation was scarcely worth two stars on TripAdvisor. Soldiers had to live in trenches, snaking cramped corridors of filth and squalor, without so much as a patio. With rats as roommates. The World War I trenches weren't the right place for conventional warfare, were they? But why did neither side think about mud wrestling? Because they're the perfect conditions, aren't they? Well, I mean, trench warfare wasn't new. I think that whilst you will get the occasional game of Christmas football, I don't think that anyone actually ever thought that uh, uh, letting the guns fall silent and having mud wrestling competitions was ever going to sort anything out. I think they missed a trick, don't you? Yup. By the way, I admire the way the professor manages to bounce off her questions. As for mud wrestling, maybe it would involve the chiefs doing wrestling instead of their soldiers. And imagine a king who fights his own battles. Wouldn't that be a sight? Eventually, the war ended at 11 o'clock on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in the year 1119 1118. Hence the term stopping for 11s. The soldiers came home to a Britain they could hardly recognise because it was wearing a skirt. While the Tommies had been away at the front, women had stepped into their old jobs. There were women milkmen, women postmen, women bus driver men, even women male prostitutes. Oh, What's true. more, the economy was in a pickle. After the war, many industries found it almost impossible to sell their goods abroad because abroad was mainly rubble. There were strikes and marches and a great depression. Things were shit out bad. Oh yeah, plus uh, pandemics, the Spanish flu, even though the Spaniards didn't ask for it and had nothing to do with it, which killed between 20 and 100 million people. So yeah, it's enough to yeah, make you want to go and see a shrink. People needed escapism, but luckily for them, the age of mass entertainment was just beginning. It was the roaring 20s. City streets were full of jazz clubs, packed with Jeeveses and Worcesters, and women with Lego haircuts dancing like they were surprised while shitting the pants at a fancy dress party. And people who couldn't afford to enjoy a roaring 20s for themselves could still watch films of other people doing it at the newly invented cinema. And these images crystallise eras and give us images that are a little bit distorted Torted, if you see what I mean, of this time where we have the image that it was all fun and stuff. Whereas 
life was actually very hard for many people. And one series I would very, very strongly recommend about it is the wonderful Babylon Berlin. In Berlin, of course, where there's this mix of poverty, ultra violence, and the wildest parties you can imagine. It's fantastic. The cinema was a cross between YouTube and theatre. Despite this, it was popular and people queued to get in. They showed Charlie Chaplin films, but even that couldn't keep them away. The I love this constant Charlie Chaplin bashing without any reason. The whole country went films bonkers. Going to the cinema in those days was more like going to a book because there was no sound. The story was explained by words on the screen. A bit like spoilers, but happening at the same time as you were watching it, so not as annoying. And if you couldn't make it to a cinema or cocktail bar, you could still enjoy the jazz age because scientists have worked out a way to force jazz into your house using a magic called radio. Radio was an exciting new invention that made it possible to hear other people's voices in your living room without the use of thin walls or a devastating mental condition. Yup, and it's a revolution in the way that it also allowed ideas and opinions to flow into your home. When the Nazis came to power, they set up a program to equip every household with a radio so that propaganda could enter their home uh, willingly or unwillingly, to be fair. To help keep the early airwaves in check, the government created something called the British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC. How come the BBC started with radio? Because radio is loads less popular than television, isn't it? There are people in radio who'd get very angry about that. Um, it's, I mean, radio still performs uh, tremendously well. There's at, still radio. There is still radio. At the time the BBC was set up, there wasn't a choice because there was no TV. Luckily, a man called John Logie Baird was about to give birth to television. Not literally out of his vagina, but metaphorically out of his shed. After doing some weird experiments like something out of Wallace and Gromit, Baird's TV was finalised, although idiotically, he'd gone to the trouble of inventing it without checking whether there were any programmes on yet. It took a while before there was anything worth putting your iPhone down for. The earliest transmissions looked like Abraham Lincoln looming through a glass door and weren't very exciting. Luckily, it was a short step from there to the BBC's first Saturday night extravaganza, TV's opening night ceremony. Vision and sound are on. The station goes on the air. The show got a record audience of 400, the sort of viewing figures BBC4 still dreams of. Despite its popularity, the BBC was causing controversy from the start and the powers that be were suspicious of it. Why did the government start the BBC in the first place? It seems like these days they're always trying to close it down. Was it one of those stupid mistakes they made, like Brexit? The government didn't strictly start the BBC. Um, the BBC was originally a private company in 1922. It employed... Um, a, a rather fierce Scottish guy called John Reith. And people still talk about Reithian values and Reithian broadcasting. Reithian values were to inform, educate and entertain. What, well, all at the same time? Yeah. Since those early days of black and white tat, the BBC has grown throughout the years to become one of the biggest programme shitty machines. Oh, that's Rod Hull. Um, I confused that guy with Rod Dahl in my Trafalgar episode and half the comments in that episode were telling me so. And actually, so I guess that's the famous video where he assaulted Parkinson on the BBC. And I think that this guy was kind of weird and a bit creepy, wasn't he? machines in the world, making groundbreaking, iconic programmes which still try to inform, educate or entertain. So the BBC is supposed to inform, educate or entertain. And entertain. I'm going to list some BBC things and I want you to say whether they inform, educate or entertain. OK. News at 10. Inform. Open University. Educate. 
Doctor Who. Entertain. Strictly Come Dancing. Entertain. Holmes Under the Hammer. Entertain. Inspector Phillips. What is Inspector Phillips? Oh, I made that one up. That was just a trick question. Okay, well, I've it didn't work. Sounds real, though, doesn't it? Inspector Phillips. No, I instantly knew that it wasn't a real one. Eat well for less. It's where Greg Wallace and another man see how much a family spend on a week shopping and then criticise them. Make them eat porridge from Lidl. In form. Well done. Sorry, I wasn't totting up the scores. Thank you. <laughs> and he says thank you. By the way, uh, so uh, Kank on Britain is a BBC programme, right? So is it meant to inform, educate or entertain? Ah. Ah. Interesting question. But this golden future of television would have to wait, because back in 1939 times, the TV signals were suddenly switched off, because someone decided to start another war to end all wars. When he became leader of Germany, Adolf Hitler was a funny looking character with silly hair, a bit like Boris Johnson, but he turned out to be a hateful maniac who would let nothing get in the way of his ambition, a bit like Boris Johnson. Okay, I'm not going to take the liberty of bouncing off this joke on Boris Johnson, even though from where I'm standing, This guy looks a bit odd at times, actually. But at first, people saw Hitler coming and it was first an object of curiosity, sometimes admiration even, and even a positive thing. Rather fascist than commies. And since he was a great charmer, he worked hard on his image, first appearing as a nice guy and as a lovely politician, then revealing himself like all narcissistic pervs, in fact. Hitler believed the Germans were an elite race, like the Grand Prix. He also thought he owned Poland, and when he went round there to get it back, Britain cried war. This country is at war with Germany. Luckily, Britain had a hero on its side, a man whose name will never be forgotten, Winton Churchill. We... Churchill's speeches were stirring and powerfully erotic. We know it will be hard. We expect it will be long. Okay, I was not ready for that. Erotic. He was one of the greatest orators of all time. And some of the phrases he used still resonate today, such as finest hour, never surrender, and of course, we shall fight them bitches. We shall fight them bitches. And I have another one, but I cannot remember. I'll try to put it. After. At any rate, that is what we are going to try to do. And we needed Churchill's stirring mumbling, because at first the war didn't go well. Within six months, France was occupied by the Nazis, who they didn't see coming because they'd been expecting the Germans. Hitler wanted to make Britain German, to match its royal family, but the RAF held Hitler's forces back in amazing dogfights in the sky that were done by aeroplanes, not actual flying dogs, which sadly, science still hasn't invented yet. This was the Battle of Britain. It seems amazing that these young men could fly and fight so well. Although when you look, you'll see the planes had tiny targets and crosses drawn on the side, which made them easier to hit. But planes weren't only used in dogfights. The Germans changed tactics. Instead of attacking planes, which could move out the way, they attacked the ground, which couldn't, in something called the Blitz. Preceded by a shower of flames. Oh, and th this makes me think that I just binged uh, Masters of the Air and maybe I do a review about this series because, to be honest, I'm not sure what I think about it yet. German bombers rain fire and high explosive bombs in their most savage attack on London. Hitler's pilots started dropping bombs, sort of aeroplane poos, and people had to hide from them. They built big tin shelters in their gardens or ran down the nearest tube station without a ticket or a valid oyster card. Countless houses were reduced to big piles of bricks and wood, which is sort of what houses are anyway, but in a different order. Despite this, thanks to the plucky British spirit, people weren't totally down in the dumps, even if they lived in one. 
People sang songs during World War Two to keep their spirits up, didn't they? How loud did they have to sing to be heard over the bombs? Well, especially as they would have sometimes been in underground stations, sheltering mm-hmm. from the bombs. It would have been loud in the underground station, the singing, if everybody was singing together. But it's true, you wouldn't have been heard much. I wonder if when they sang, they used to time their singing with the explosions. That would be a fun thing to do. It would be difficult. Be very difficult to time it. Mm. It's quite random, the falling of bombs. In the war, there were lots of songs. Very good point. And that's what's annoying about bombs falling on you from the sky is that they don't have the thoughtfulness to warn you beforehand. And that's very rude, if I may be permitted a personal opinion. Bombs taking the piss out of Hitler, weren't they? How come they don't sing those sorts of songs anymore? Well, he's not around anymore, so it's not so amusing. Where is he? Well, he's dead. He's dead? Yes. Oh, right, so it'd be disrespectful to... Well, not so much disrespectful as um, pointless, really. Pointless. A bit pointless. But I saw in a film that he came back at some point in the movie Er ist wieder da. He's back. And maybe his spirit actually is still there in a form or another. Yeah. A lot of singing was needed because even when the Blitz ended, the war was far from over. There were many huge battles to come, most of which will never be forgotten because they've since been converted into blockbuster movies. How was it we beat the Germans at Dunkirk in War II but still didn't win the whole war? Well, first of all, I think we've got to stop calling it War II. I mean, it's the Second World War if you're American and you have to have it this way, it's World War II, but... A little bit of exasperation there for Professor Jackson, and I understand it. You know, that, that's, that's the language we tend to use. But in terms of Dunkirk, I think that's the wrong way round. We actually lose at Dunkirk. We lost at Dunkirk? We lost at Dunkirk. I, mean, I don't it's... think so. It turns out Dunkirk was a huge disaster. Like most sequels, War Two was proving less fun than War One. Dunkirk is, you can say, it's a moral victory in the sense that we didn't lose as badly as we thought we would. But as Churchill said, war is not won by evacuations. What made the war harder was that we didn't know what the Germans were planning because they said it in a sort of code language known as German. It took a team of British boffins using a magic typewriter called the Enigma Machine literally loads of time to crack it, but crack it they did. And with Germany's secrets twatted wide open, Britain and its allies were able to organise D-Day and invade France, but in a nice way. The English have landed, les Anglais ont débarqué, and I let you Google that to find out what this expression means in French. Elegant. And yes, it's perhaps the friendliest invasion in our history. Apart from the people who got their houses bombed and were a little bit exasperated by the Allied bombing, of course. But as they say, à la guerre comme à la guerre. It's a bit like when in Rome do as the Romans, but apply to war. In gruelling and exciting scenes like these, expertly depicted in the pulse-quickening video game Call of Duty 2, Soldiers scrambled out of their boats, looking for power-ups and health kits, terrified every second that a Nazi bullet might kill them, forcing them to respawn several feet away and be delayed by a number of seconds. I don't know how many hours I spent on this game, but it was crazy at the time. I felt like I was replaying uh, Saving Private Ryan, then doing Band of Brothers missions. A huge banger. Eventually the British won, and immediately there was widespread jubilation and people dancing about in black and white and getting off with people who were almost certainly dead now. A new, hopeful era had dawned, an era which 41 years later included the BBC painting and decorating television sitcom Brushstrokes. Okay, she's called it today. I don't know where her fascination with this series comes from, but I find it pretty amusing. Okay, that's it for me today. Thank you for watching and talk to you very soon. Bye.